Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Whenever you're listening to us, it's a good time. We are back with the NRL podcast, No Reps Left podcast. Here with Jensen Morris, Tommy Schuster, and Mike Nassif back in the house. Um, kind of jumping off of the first episode that we actually decided to split into multiple because we went down a nice little rabbit hole on the first one. We are continuing with our over slash underrated topics. First ones that we did were about training. Uh, this one we're going to hop into nutrition. And if we have some time, also some PDs. Before we get into them with Tom's first over undertake, just wanted to put a reminder out there that all three of us are coaches. I will link our Instagrams down below so you can check us out through there. And then also, this is all for entertainment and educational purposes only. None of us are medical professionals. We are not saying you should do any of this. This is just for fun. With all that being said, Tom, what's your under over for nutrition? All right. So over or underrated? High days specifically. So not talking refeeds, not talking cheat meals, just high days specifically. Can I ask if it's, are we... Are we talking in an off-season context or a prep? Off-season. Okay. I'm going to say overrated. I'm going to say, say overrated because how I see this is in an off-season, you know, we're probably at a point where we're not glycogen depleted. Um, we're going to be in a surplus regardless, so – it's kind of just shifting that energy balance higher than it already is, but it's already at a point where things are high. Um, I think there there could be utility with like, I mean, I've tried this with people, um, you know, having higher carb days on the weaker body part, um, you know, maybe utilizing some insulin around that day, um, just kind of shifting like a bigger flux of um, food around that period. I think it's really two in the weeds. I don't, you know, over the course of a year with two people, you know, things alike, I don't think it's ultimately going to make one person drastically different or even anything that I would consider pretty noticeable. I think psychologically also is a component as well. Like you have, for example, a high day on your most demanding, let's say leg day, um, you know, you're probably going to feel that, oh, I have more energy to stay. Um, you know, I got more food. I'm going to perform better. So, I mean, I, I think, we can't go without saying that portion of it, but overall, I would say overrated. I'm curious, what's your um take on prep versus off season in terms of high days? Yeah, I mean, for sure, I, I would say the same thing. It's kind of like refeeding, pretty much. Um, usually, how I'll set up someone's prep even before I start, um, you know, pre plan or, or giving actual like a refeed. Um, I'll usually put someone into just like a carb cycling rotation out of the gate, whether it's like three low, one high, two low, one high days. Um, just kind of keep things consistent like that and just have that um, variation in the flux of of energy balance. And um, psychologically, I think, and physiologically, like, you know, keeping um, thyroid hormone regulation, um, psychologically knowing like you're going to have some string of like really hard diet days and then you know things are going to back off a little bit so i mean yeah for sure all right jensen i i mean for the i was going to say you actually put literally everything of the every single thing that i was going to say mike because it's like if leg turns already full pushing even more calories probably doesn't do that much it might have a placebo effect if you're going to push even more on the high days Try to save it for a day that you're trying to focus even more on growing. You probably will need a little bit of insulin, especially if you're also adding more HGH that day for the body part that you're prioritizing. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I would do with that. For prep, yeah, basically the same thing. I mean, it's just if someone's struggling to sleep, then I might just give them a day or two while we're having a few extra carbs before bed just to get that serotonin spike a little bit. If they're not getting good pumps in the gym, maybe I'll give them a few extra carbs pre-lift. Um I wouldn't even say that extra carbs post lift are even that important. I mean, they're going to fill up their glycogen over the course of the day, even if uh, even if they have to have a little bit of gluconeogenesis to get it later in the day, like protein breaking down into carbs for the people that are just listening. Um, so yeah, I I have literally nothing left to add. I think you <laughs> elucidated that pretty much perfectly. I mean, yeah, exactly. You guys both nailed like the exactly what I was going to say on like all friends pretty much. And uh, again, on prep, one thing I do want to add is I think it may be even more overrated on prep to have a high day or, or refeed than maybe even in the off season, because 
you have the option of having a diet break. And I think a lot of people think the only option as well is adding food and not necessarily pulling back on activity. So that is one thing that I think is also overrated is people only think, okay, the only fatigue drop we're going to get here is if we start feeding this person more food. Well, this guy's doing like three hours of cardio and eating, you know, still a solid amount of food. Let's maybe, hey, let's maybe not do some cardio this day. That, that could be an option as well. So yeah, that's, that's the only other context I'd add to that. Yeah, I agree for sure with that. I think that's a big player. Just like imagining fatigue. I mean, that could be a whole podcast on its own, but um, food is definitely not the only variable. Like there's so many times I won't touch someone's diet, but I'll say, hey, I don't want you doing any cardio for the next three days and don't have a stop count. Just, you know, do the mandatory and and carry on. Um, and those on its own, you really got to look at what is the main driver of fatigue at any point in time. And that's probably what you're going to want to pull back on when you do. 100%. All right. All right. Uh, I'll give mine. I think it's a pretty quick one. Um, over or underrated? Having a ton of veggies to be full when you're super hungry on prep or like an aggressive mini cut phase. I would say that's not only overrated. I would say that's counterproductive for the most part. Um, just because, you know, you're eating a ton of veggies. Let's say in the off season, you're used to a certain amount of fiber as your calories get low. Um, you kind of want that fiber to, you know, come down coinciding. You don't want to change that ratio of fiber to the total amount of calories you're eating in general. Uh, so that's kind of like a general rule of thumb is like, as food gets higher, maybe you start removing some of those extra fiber sources just because you're getting that extra fiber from, uh, your your carbohydrate sources that you're eating throughout the day as your calories continue to drop, those fiber sources are going to start to drop. So you may be able to raise some veggies, but going any above what your ratio may have been or what your ratio may have been that keeps you regular uh, may either cause you to go to the restroom too much, too little, and just causes a bunch of bloating issues in general. So I don't necessarily think food volume is something that you really should be playing with if you're a, comp a competitor. Uh, in terms of just, you know, going too crazy by adding a shit ton of veggies to your meals. Uh, but then again, you know, if you are a lifestyle client, a person who's just trying to get in shape and you have some trouble with hung hunger signaling, there could be some minor utility here and there. Uh, but I think for the most part, you know, just accept the fact that you're going to be hungry. Like that that's what it is. A lot of people are too terrified of hunger for whatever reason, just because of our historical background and whatever ancestry, uh, evolutionary biology, what, what have you. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my take. Just accept the fact that you're going to be hungry and find other ways to deal with it. I agree, but I'm gonna throw, I guess one little, one little wrench in there. What if it's not, what if it's a non-calciferous veggie, so you don't definitely bloat too, too much from it. And it's towards the lower fiber side. It's more like one of the super watery veggies like cucumbers, for example? Hmm. Um, I've still had some people have some issues with cucumbers, actually, to be honest. So like, even then, I would still say, if you're not cooking your veggies, and you're just having, you're just adding veggies to your meals, just for it to be more voluminous, and not necessarily have any additional nutritional value, it may not necessarily be uh, productive. But again, that's very individual as well. Yeah, that's, that's a fair take. What do you think? I'm say overrated for sure. Um, I mean, I feel like everyone at some point has tried to do like, like five salads a day when you're dieting and it just wreaks havoc on your digestion. Um, so, I mean, that, that for sure on its own, I would say absolutely not. Same thing like Tom said with when people are moving from like an off season to a prep or, or growth phase to dieting, we need to stop, in my opinion, thinking of like changing food sources around so much and, and think of it more so as foods up, foods down, everything else is the same, you know, um, just because you weren't doing something in the off season, now you're in prep, you really shouldn't be like, all right, let's add this. And now just because we're dieting, like don't change around variables too much. Um, fiber intake as well. I mean, that's a big player in prep too, especially as food comes down and, and you have less volume and like passing bowel movements and stuff. But um especially certain types of veggies, you know, when you start throwing off like your ratio of fibers and soluble to insoluble and, and you kind of just start overloading that it, it can really mess things up if you go overboard with it. And I mean, like anything, moderation's key, 
but people tend to take everything and be like, just just run with it full course. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really liked your guys' take on that. If anything, it probably dissuaded me a bit from telling competitors specifically, like, hey, because I'll have a note for like a lot of my lifestyle people where it's just like, you know, when I have to completely pull out like the rice or potato or sourdough bread or pasta option from a meal, I'm just like, all right, we had to pull carbs from somewhere. So sorry, your middle meals of the day that aren't pre or post lift or pre bed. Sorry, you're not really getting any starches. So I'll just be like, I'll put a note where I'm just like, you know, uh, turn this into a salad in order to make it more filling. That still makes sense for them. But yeah, when it comes down to like really big competitors, we need like a large volume of veggies to actually significantly feel more full. First of all, I think competitors should just get used to being more hungry because it's probably going to make the waist tighter, honestly. If you're like kind of hungry and you can kind of hit a strong vacuum throughout any part of the day, that's probably going to help. Um, but yeah, I liked I like this. I like this take. So I'm glad I glad I asked that one. Uh, Mike, your turn. I'm gonna say food diversity. Overrated as fuck. So fucking overrated. And we also kind of just covered this for the last question. So I'm <laughs> so fucking overrated. And here, here's here's the way that I encompass it to people that know literally nothing about science, have never dieted, but heard. Okay, here's the food pyramid. You need to have 18 different things from each thing. Is the U.S. system, whatever, I won't go down the fucking rabbit hole. We, are, we, we all know that our system is fucking horrible in the U.S. for food recommendations. But our ancestors didn't eat 18 different things from each fucking food category. It's not necessary. Your ancestors, which then determine your genetics and your epigenetics of what you can handle best, they weren't eating 18 different things from each fucking food category. So there is no reason that you have to think that, oh, I need this insane diversity in order to be my healthiest self. There's just no way that that's how that works. You need just enough diversity that you're getting in a broad range of macros, or sorry, a broad range of micros and all the phytonutrients that you want from fruits and vegetables, but no one knows exactly how much of each of those is even going to be beneficial. So you're probably just better off optimizing digestion rather than just like, let me have this, let me have this, let me have this, let me just throw it in the kitchen sink and hope that that makes me healthier through some proposed mechanism that no one has ever actually explained to make sense in any way that I've heard. I will have to strongly disagree with that statement just based on the fact that there's only pretty much, <clears throat> excuse me, only pretty much two things that we know about the gut. And one of them is that, you know, having a diverse microbiome in terms of your gut bacteria is going to be probably more beneficial than having less of a diverse microbiome in terms of your gut bacteria in the way that we sort of accomplish it that accomplish that is by feeding it a bunch of different diverse fruits and vegetables. Um, and that's pretty much my only reason that I think that it is beneficial in terms of having a diverse diet. I think eating too much of the same thing over and over and over again can cause some sort of food insensitivities and tolerances, whether or not that's bro science, I don't know, but I've seen it happen a few times. So just based on that fact alone, I would say that having a diverse diet is important. No, it doesn't need to be overblown to where like all your meals are completely different in terms of vegetables and fruits and proteins and stuff. But I think having like a solid rotation of like four to four to five different protein sources that you can go throughout your week, uh, maybe four to five different carbohydrate sources that you can rotate fruits, um, starches, grains, and, you know, obviously rotate your fat sources as well would be beneficial. But I'm not saying that, you know, it's the end all be all and that you have to have Every single one of your meals has to have a different food group in it. But I think, you know, just eating plain chicken and rice every single day is probably not the best thing either. So I'd say having some type of diversity is definitely underrated considering we are speaking to the bodybuilding population here. And most of them are white fish, rice, chicken, rice, steak, rice. And, you know, switching it up is definitely going to be beneficial in terms of gut protocols. Right. When you put it that way, I agree more. I think I was kind of thinking like in a different number sense than you were. Like I will always say that like two or three different protein sources a day, or at least across, like like I'll have people have some more slightly fattier meats on their off days and their training days just because I'll have the carbs higher and then sometimes the fat's a little bit higher on the off days, whether it's a, as a percentage or total, depending on where they're at. But yeah, two to three different protein sources. Like I'll say three different protein sources across the week at least, four different fruit sources, at least three different veggie sources. And then like, I would say just like maybe two, maybe three different starch sources. So I think we actually kind of agree. I was just taking it. Yeah. 
extreme. We <laughs> took the two different extremes, uh, extreme ends of the equation. For you, sure. you can tell that I've had some new clients come to me that are just like, why? I heard I need to change it up every day. No, you don't. You need to actually hit your fucking macros so you can listen. I, genu I genuinely thought you were joking when you were like overrated as fuck. I was like, I was like, fuck, I was like you took it too far though. Like I knew, I knew you were on the same page as me, but because I, I think it's very underrated, but I think you were thinking in like the extreme sense of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, for sure. I, I would say underrated. Um, I think the number one cause of, um, I would say second cause, second cause of um, all GI issues, I would say stress is first, but is lack of food diversity. I mean, uh, I've seen so many uh, GI cases and GI maps from my own clients and even some of uh, or a lot of other coaches clients who came to me for um, kind of just like consulting and all of their diets are, are usually no veggies, no fruits. It's rice five times a day. There's no reason, uh, you know, we can't diversify this and rotate, you know, a few different, two to three different fruits throughout the day, two to three different veggies, um, having some spinach, maybe in your eggs, um, you know, putting potatoes in one meal, uh, rotating your protein sources. When you do the same thing every day, I mean, Tom kind of hit this on the head, but you don't get um, one, just like a, a diversity of your, your micronutrients and minerals and um, vitamins and all of this. It, it's really important that you get that through you know, rotating these foods because nothing is really in a simple term, like a, a perfect food that's going to hit all of that for you. And just with the microbiome as well, making sure that we're getting all different kinds of uh, beneficial bacteria, it's going to be through your diet. So I think a lot of um, current day GI issues could be um, prevented and um, not needed to, to go through kind of these protocols and add in all these supplements. If in the first place you were just eating a well-rounded diet, I think there's like a caveat to that too, with, you know, you take a bigger guy who's maybe eating like 6,000 calories a day, you know, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult to have like veggies in your diet. Um, you know, fruits is something I'll always, no matter why, I think it's a very uh, easy food source to get in and actually makes things taste better. It's like a little dessert after meals, but even veggies with people, I'll, I'll never pull it out. I mean, it'll make things harder for some people, but it's something I'll always keep in people's diets regardless. And it's usually a constant through growing, dieting, whatever it is. And I'm just going to put one little note that I think kind of encompasses a lot of this too, from the different perspectives that people could be thinking about this as. If you're someone who has actually gotten to the point in your bodybuilding career, lifestyle career, whatever, where you're eating whole foods consistently, food diversity is going to benefit you. <laughs> if you are someone who's just like, I want to try this recipe and this recipe and this recipe with all these different weird diet sauces or just with any type of processed foods, if you're just in, you know, in Walmart and you're like, I want to try that snack, I want to try that snack, I want to try that snack. That is not what we are talking about. <laughs> so that's kind of why I was going with the like, I live right. I'm like, no, you don't need to like take some new fucking thing off of Pinterest every single day and make that. But yeah, if you're having whole quality foods, it's like getting a broad spectrum is probably going to assist you more than the opposite. It's more chances for shit to help you versus more chances for shit to fuck you up. <laughs> I think about it. Um, Tom, uh, I think yeah, we get through it pretty well. You want to hit, hit us with your PD question? Get a spicy Absolutely. All right. So let's, let's dive into some of the some of the darker side of uh, the equation right here with the PEDs. Um, so I am going to go with my first PED, um, over or underrated proviron in Under a bodybuilding context. For men or women? For men. Okay. Underrated. I'm, I'm gonna say underrated for a few reasons. Um, one, I haven't seen crazy skewed um, lipid profiles from Proviron compared to other orals. Two, I think in an off season or a contest prep, I love it in a contest prep. Um, you know, one, it has some um, uh, AI like properties. So um, that's obviously beneficial towards the end of a contest prep. Um, potentially a use for limiting direct AI use as well. Um, two, lowering SHBG, 
um, getting more free testosterone circulation, I think in an off season setting or a contest prep, that's going to be very, very beneficial. I don't think from like a, a pure, um, like muscle accrual standpoint, it, it's a super powerful anabolic, but I think for the other reasons and, uh, the cosmetic effect in a contest prep is pretty cool as well. Um, from a muscle accrual standpoint or a strength standpoint, I don't think it's even comparable to other orals. Um, but I like it. Yeah. I mean, I agree with everything Mike said. I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with it. I think just the main place that it would come in would be to be to boost free testosterone or to just deliver a specifically like harder look without having to use one of the more toxic hardeners like Winstrol or something like that. Yeah. So I would say honestly overrated, to be honest, just based off the fact that one of the only things ProBiron is used for is lowering SHBG. SHBG by what I've read from Kurt, and I'm sure Kurt can come on here later and elaborate on it, so I'm not going to butcher whatever he puts out there, but basically going to get some of the uh, explanation is, you know, SHBG doesn't necessarily have anything correlative in terms of building muscle. So, like, SHBG could be crushed just from the fact that you're using other anabolics. You're using Mastron, you're using Pr uh, Primo. If you're on a prep, you're probably using Trend. Those all, all are all of those other anabolics in conjunction with testosterone is already going to lower your SHBG, based on the fact that you're probably at towards the end of prep when you're going to implement Proviron. Don't really see too many people using it in the off season. And again, if you are SHBG, doesn't really matter too too much. That number alone isn't really going to do anything uh, in terms of like if it's too low, that's one thing. If it's too high, that's another thing. But your free testosterone isn't necessarily even that correlative with SHPG. If you really look into uh, the numbers, if you crush the data and you actually can see that, okay, my SHPG, when it's lower past a certain point, my free testosterone doesn't actually get higher. There's like a threshold there. And if you're crushing your SHPG down to like one or zero, it's like, okay, well, or if we crush any hormone down to one or zero, is that gonna be beneficial for muscle growth? Probably not. And just based off the fact that it's not anabolic at all, it's pretty much just going to be like a weaker AI. So why not use something like aromacin? Why not use something like um, uh, anastrozole or letrozole or something like that? Yeah, that's a good argument. Yeah, yeah, and Kurt, I think he, once again, I don't want to, I just need to learn and explain it, but he, he was, I think, I don't know if you were texting about it or one of the other videos that he did with like Dean St. Martin or something, but he was saying that it might even have its own receptors at this point too. So it might, SHBG might by itself have its own function. It's just, we don't know exactly what it does yet, but if it's to the point where it's like, it has its own kind of uh, role in the ecosystem that might be not just transporting or like blinding things up that then can bind other receptors, it's probably best to just not fuck with it too, too hard. But I don't know exactly. I don't think the researchers even know exactly. So that's what I, but yeah, that was, that was a very good point. Um, okay, so I'll do, we'll just keep it the same order we did before. So mine is over underrated, uh, fast acting injectables as a pre-lift boost, as opposed to using orals for a pre-lift boost. I guess, I guess we'll put this specifically, I mean, you can do prep or off season, but I had more prep in mind when you would typically, you know, use the orals towards the end. This is going to be a theoretical answer. I like it because I I don't use those with people. I mean I I've I've tried and like injecting a super draw myself like me and Tom have before training, um. But I don't <laughs> I never give it to a client. Um, I think. Oh man, I don't know. I'll start. I it's also hard to say with like. Like, for example, it's, like, hard to say, like, with does injectable super draw, for example, like, does that bypass liver metabolism because it's injectable? Like, so, like, in theory, thinking about it, I'm like, okay, that, that would probably be, like, a better option. Um, you know, maybe it's not going to halt your appetite, like, generally orals doing an off-season either. Um, I, I don't have enough experience or I don't feel there's enough research for me to give kind of opinion past that. I mean, both work, but what is better i don't know i would say from my experience overrated 
Um, like Mike was saying, I tried injectable super draw this past off season and it made me feel like shit. Like it could just be super draw or the fact that it was injectable, but it made me feel like absolute shit. Um, based off what I've seen online, uh, Vigor Steve puts out a bunch of videos on carrier oils and what you actually need to use to dissolve uh, some of those orals is actually very, very harsh. And if you actually look at the chemicals like glycol and you actually drop some of that oil on top of your stopper, it burns a hole through the, the stopper and you're putting that in your body it's probably not the best thing to stick inside of you and inject you if it's burning holes in rubber. So based on that, I would say it's probably a little bit more overrated uh, than, than it is underrated. It could have utility. Maybe you could have like a really good uh, supplier or a chemist or something who could make something dissolved in, um, you know, MCT or water-based and not necessarily use some of those harsher carrier oils to dissolve it. But for the most part, I would say probably overrated just based off the fact of sourcing alone, not based off theory. So, yeah, those are pretty good and diverse answers. I So I have a lot of experience from my powerlifting days, uh, some of which I've experimented with, with, with bodybuilding, hypothetically, maybe, um, for training sessions. And I'll say this, if you, a shot of, Trend Ace, for example, like three or four hours before a lift seems to do a lot more for me than taking even a significant amount of most orals when it comes to training performance with less sides. But a lot of the more common pre-lift injectables, they're going to leave a fucking well. They're going to be inflamed. That might piss you off while you're lifting, especially say, say a parallel figure is to use a poor bench or something. They do it in their delt or something. Having a constant pain in there, it's going to like fuck up your alignment and stuff. So I'd say it can be over and underrated at different times, but it's like, if someone's on, like what I was say, say you're at the end of the prep and someone, you know, you threw in the train ace four, six, eight weeks out, whatever. And you can bias the timing of it to maybe give you more of a hit for your workout rather than just like taking it when you first get up or just taking it whenever you consistently take it. I do think that that can make a difference with training performance. So in that sense, with the timing sense, if you're already doing something that works for you, I'd say it's underrated and maybe would be better than taking certain other orals. But if it's going to give you a, uh, a major like hit issue or if you're <laughs> taking something that would burn through your skin normally then yeah that's probably a shitty option and you're probably just uh better giving your liver a good old power run challenge <laughs> than uh than doing the injectable that could give you an abscess or something like that i like i like that question that was that was a nice controversial theoretical one i will I say well go ahead i have another kind of theoretical question so with tne so tesla wester Let's say in theory, someone's test dosage was weekly test dosage was 750. Um, what would you think about, and I've never did this, but, I, but I've been thinking about it. If say you did like a weekly um, 500 of, let's say, an ethyl ester, yeah. and then you did 50 milligrams of TNE prior to every training session, would that benefit you do you think you would benefit more from doing it the, the only counter to that i thought i'm like i mean with like aromatization is that going to be a lot faster i mean it will be faster with the no ester but um, that's what i was going to say is with tne what i've seen is that it actually aromatizes a lot more than or faster or people just get more gyno basically off tne than than enanthate or prop propionate so um, I would say pro that that's theoretical. If you could control for E2, would it have some additional benefit from just having that condensed, that, that extra 250 makes condensed for those workout windows? Who knows? It's like one of those things. It's like, would it be like that 0.5 percentage that just adds up over time uh, uh, consistently? Or it, are you, you know, not necessarily doing anything extra just because testosterone is testosterone is just going to be in the background anyway so yeah, yeah I, mean, I just think about it from like the aggression perspective uh, i've actually never used tne but then just talking to people who i know have they're like yeah i want to run through a fucking wall after i take it they're yeah. like man if we could get drive that more aggression in the workout window over the long term who knows what happens 
I think test no ester is fun. You should try a trend no ester slash trend base. Then you can do a mental trend, and then you can compare that to check drops, and then you can just be a master of the dark arts and uh, have a billion different options for if you ever just want to punch a hole in the wall and fuck it. So no one knows what check drops are. Definitely look. Okay. Uh, yeah, my bowl around. It's the most toxic thing. It shouldn't exist. Um, I think they're slightly overrated because Halo is probably going to get people even more aggressive and that's the whole point of it but two little fun facts um mike tyson it said the lore is that he took check drop slash my bowler on before he bit the guy's ear off other fun facts since we were talking about uh tv uh have you guys ever smelled the specific kind of sweet smell that comes out of someone's pores after they use that snow ester i don't remember what it is specifically in um, the carrier that makes it smell, but it's it's sweet. Um, I've sm I've smelled people smell like like sweat like gear. Like I've smelled that before, but is that is that what you're talking about? No, it's it's different. It's once again, I don't know what it. It doesn't smell like gear. It doesn't smell like the super weird high androgen like trend sweat. It it, it almost kind of smells good. It literally smells sweet. So like if you go to a powerlifting gym and you walk past someone and it's it's not cologne and it's not perfume and they're just like eyes are fucking bugging out of their head and you see some chick you know pulling four or five for reps and she's only 130 pounds or something, you might be on that same answer. So don't let her don't let her snatch you up. She might she might be on the prowl after she busts out that four or five for reps set. Uh, this is a theoretical question, but are check drops as safe as Halo tested? <laughs> I don't know. Let's ask go TIA and a little more battles at the end, and then maybe he'll have another really fucking stupid answer that five of us need to make videos about the dispel before anyone takes what he says seriously. I just wanted to get Jensen going on that one, but Mike, yes, did, I, did I tell you that the person? I'll, this will be the only thing that I, I continue to speak on for that because I don't want to get a sidetrack. But the guy that he sent me to look at his blood work to to prove that Halo was safe. Um, I'm friends with him now, and I might have him on the bros chat. He is like a 300, I think, 40-ish pound um, guy overseas. And, uh, yeah, he's a cool guy. But I might be helping him out with some of this programming, man. So, T-O-M-M, thank you for the potential client, the new friend. I appreciate you, buddy. Keep saying stupid shit that I can keep this proven for you. We appreciate you. Uh, All right. Mike, like your question. I'm going to say... T3 in a contest prep. I mean, if they have HGH in, I think it's overrated. I think a lot of people would be better off from using T4 if they have a bunch of HGH in place and they over prioritize T3. But it obviously has its place. So, oh, uh, I would say probably overrated. Um, yeah, I would say probably overrated. There's there's nuance there, obviously, but. I mean, you could use T4 monotherapy, um, like Jensen was saying, you could just try and maintain, you know, some type of thyroid function throughout with just correct refeeding, having a longer prep um, and, you know, doing some more fatigue management as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's a bunch of different ways you could take it. I think T3 is kind of like the easy route to go about it because you're just supplying that thyroid hormone. It's kind of, you know, pretty play safe. Uh, but, you know, there's probably better strategies of handling that prep if you're a little bit more hands on in terms of blood work and uh, being able to be there with that person in terms of communication very, very often. So I'm going to say underrated. Um, with that being said, don't uh, I'm not saying this is something that should be abused. Um, however, going through a contest prep, I would say most people are going to have down regulation of thyroid hormone. So um, as you navigate through the prep and, and your free hormone levels start to go lower and lower, yes, there's plenty of ways you can try and manage it through refeeding, having a slower rate of loss with things um, and, you know, managing those variables. But in my opinion, I think it's a lot more difficult to do and, and, it doesn't happen in as many situations as we want it to. I mean, it, you can for sure do it, like Lacomni Naturals prep. But um, I think it for sure has utility. 
Um, just making sure that you stay. I, I don't think it has good usage for driving someone um, hyperthyroid. However, um, you know, just keeping them at that like high normal range, I think that can make things a lot smoother for people. You'll see a lot less need to um, dig as hard with dieting, um, dig as hard with cardio, um, and then in turn, you know, that managing fatigue. Um, at the end of a prep, I think the end result would be a lot better if um, people use a little bit of T3 to keep things in an optimal range. With that being said, I always prefer T3 over T4 in a prep because what people fail to realize is, okay, you can supplement with T4, but it's not active. It still has to go through a conversion process to be, um, to, to convert to T3. And, you know, T4 can convert to T3 or reverse T3. And then we know what causes um, for conversion and causes that T4 to go to reverse T3, stress, mineral deficiencies. What does a contest prep do? You have drugs and you have high cardio, you have low food, you're stressed. Uh, mineral deficiencies, food's coming down, food's getting lower, and you're probably not having variety anymore. Um, so I'd rather just go with the thing that we know is actually going to be able to be used by the body. Uh, I think some people say use T4 and T3 to keep the proper ratios. I don't think it matters. Um, always go with straight T3, but um, I mean, clinically, like when you're talking about that in HRT, you'll usually always start with T4. Um, but, and, and you know, if that's not doing the job for people, then they'll move into dual therapy, but in a contest, but I'd always go T3. Yeah. And I will say the benefit of using T3 monotherapy versus T4 monotherapy is T4 is going to drive up TBG, which is thyroid binding globulin while using T3 necessarily isn't. So you could, you know, make a case that if you're using T3 monotherapy, you could leverage that super physiologically instead of leveraging T4 super physiologically, just so you're not driving up TBG and in turn, probably also, you know, binding up the thyroid that you're actively putting in your body. So I would say that's, that's one benefit. I just want to make it clear too, for the viewers, I'm not saying T3 is something that needs to be used. There's, you should be pulling thyroid labs during preps. Like I'll usually do it with someone around that like eight to 12 week out mark, or if I'm seeing a stall with things so I can see what free hormone levels look like. If they're, you know, not in a good position and sometimes that'll happen no matter how well you diet someone and, and slow rate of loss, it's still going to happen. You know, if things are off, then that could be a good time to implement it. But I don't think it's something like, you know, you just throw in for the sake of it and say, hey, let's let's drive things faster here. Um, you know, this should be based on free hormone levels. Yeah, that's true. I would say like also my my take on it was based off, you know, kind of the um what is being put out in the education space where it makes it seem almost like T3 is like a necessity of prep or we should be putting it in, you know, at like the very start of like every single person's prep, um, you know, as kind of like a prophylactic because, hey, T3 is going to come down anyways. And I guess maybe I don't necessarily see it as a need for every single person, like you were saying, Mike, uh, but also I could see it being underrated in terms of, you know, the whole demonization of T3 to a, a in the 2000s, 2010s, where, you know, every person's, every person's marketing strategy, every coach's marketing strategy was like, okay, yeah, I don't use T3 in my clients, but my, my clients are healthy. And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about because your clients probably all have super down-regulated thyroid towards the end of prep, um, just because, you know, you're not wanting to utilize a certain drug just because you're demonizing it just because other coaches at that time were using 100 micrograms of t3 and that was the standard where now you know we're kind of understanding and realizing that hey you know there's a case to for replacement it doesn't necessarily need to be pushed to that 50 microgram 100 microgram uh, range but we can kind of keep in that 25 to 37.5 range and still have some productive preps without uh, you know, health markers necessarily taking a, a downswing towards the back end of prep or post prep. I also think it's important to talk about because a lot of people hear T3 and they're like, oh, I'm going to be on this for the rest of my life and I'm going to have thyroid shut down and all of that nonsense. Um, the thyroid is so resilient and there's plenty of research to show that upon cessation of thyroid hormone, granted that calories are in an adequate position. 
the rebound of uh, your natural production is very, very quick. Um, it's There are a lot of studies that show that, and I've never, ever had someone who hasn't been able to get natural production back and in the same, if not a better position as they were in before. Yeah, I was going to say, I would argue that having your thyroid crash for so long because you refuse to use T3, it might be harder to get full function back than it was if you just artificially supplied some at the end. I would, I would probably say the same thing for testosterone and a lot of other things that we use in prep, honestly, but it's, it's definitely included in that list where it's like you keep it more normal and then you, you know, wean it out or just take it out and you're giving your body the whole food thing that it, you know, didn't have before. That's why it was crashing to start with. It's going to be like, oh, you're overall healthier? Cool. We'll work with you a little bit. So. hundred percent. I, I think even an enhanced prep. I mean, there's nuance to that. An enhanced prep is a lot safer than a, nat than a natural prep when using HRT. So TRT in a physiological range and T3 as needed to keep you in a physiological range. Um, you know, past that, obviously it's not healthy for us, but having a crash thyroid isn't healthy for you. Um, you know, having crash testosterone isn't healthy for you. If we can use things to manage those throughout a prep and keep things stable where we want them, it's going to be a lot better. Yeah, that is that, that is like pretty much something a lot of people would see as controversial, but I 100% fully agree that natural preps are almost as bad for you as, you know, going a little bit overboard with, with the drugs, to be honest. And obviously that's not like a blanket statement. There's, there's nuance there in every individual is going to respond differently. There's obviously some natural freaks out there who've been competing 20 years and they look perfectly healthy. And there's some enhanced guys out there who are on the Mr. Olympia stage who look like they're doing pretty good blood work marker wise um, and health wise. So, yeah, I mean, obviously there is going to be some, some, some sacrifice there for sure. Yeah. I want to do a whole episode on that because that's a strong opinion of mine. Um, I'll leave the whole, you know, if you're going to, purposely fuck up your body for a sport you might just do the one that makes you look like an awesome freak instead of just looking smaller than me when i was a fucking swimmer but whatever that's that's me talking shit on people that do natural body building for the wrong reasons plenty of good reasons to do it moral reasons whatever but if you think that it's healthier you're a fucking idiot just like the vegans who think that being vegan makes you fucking healthier you're an idiot just like people who think that being carnivore makes you automatically healthier you're a fucking idiot just want to let all of you guys know that so you get mad listen to more of my shit getting more mad at me uh but I love this episode, guys. That was fantastic. Uh, maybe ne next episode, we that's even the one we do, just like natural versus enhanced prep, which one is more unhealthy, because I think that'd be a fun one to talk about. But um, I had to eat my food, get to training. But appreciate all of you guys who tuned into this one. Um, we're going to be, like I said, dropping these every week and such. Definitely, you know, if you want to help us out, engage with us, like, comment, share, save, everything you can depending on what social media that you're uh, watching this on but i think watching youtube probably helps us out the most if you can do that we extra appreciate you um all of instagrams to reach out to us via coaching will be in the um in the box down below once again education entertainment hope you guys learned something don't actually apply it of course um but yeah have a great rest of the morning midday night we appreciate you. No reps left. Signing out. Peace.